Hi guys, it's Danielle with North Lawn Flower Farms. In today's video, I wanted to share with you seven lessons for beginner flower farmers. Now these are all lessons that I feel are sometimes overlooked by beginner growers, and I understand why. You know, we're an image-driven culture, and you're there on Instagram, and you're seeing this ginormous handful of beautiful rare blooms you've never seen before. The seeds cost $6 for 10 seeds, and you think, well, I gotta grow that, and I gotta grow this, and we're driven by the end beautiful result. But honestly, when it comes to flower farming, it's about what you don't see, and it's really important to invest in the things that are underneath the ground, that are gonna hold your flowers up, and to know the pests and diseases that are out there. So I wanna get started right from the beginning of the season and hopefully moving onward. So the first lesson is to know your market, and plan and plant accordingly. So it's important to isolate who is your customer. Do you have intent to sell to a florist? Are you planning to do wedding work? Or are you planning to do more farm to table bouquets that you plan to sell on your own land? That is going to determine a lot of what you grow, when you plant, color palette, um, let me try to give you an example from my own life. I've been doing uh, flower farming professionally for four years. And when I first got started, I did sell to some florist. But I realized quickly that once I added in my time per hour in talking to the florists beforehand, harvesting exactly what they wanted, taking it to them, that it really was not profitable for me to do that at the end of the day. Especially, I'm here in a tourist town and we do have a good bit of land on a main road. So I found it to be much more profitable for myself and my husband to sell mixed bouquets here on our farm at our farm stand. I was able to make a lot more money doing that. And that is going to influence what I'm planting. You know, since I'm planting here on our farm for people visiting our farm stand, I'm gonna avoid things like lysianthus, like ranunculas, like dahlias. And why? They're beautiful, but guess what? At the end of the day, they don't really bring me the profit necessary to support those plants because my customer is gonna buy it because it's colorful, it's beautiful, and it's ready to be put onto their table. I'm not worried that, um, that thrips and tarnished plant bugs are going to attack my dahlia tubers, which are already expensive. You know, they need a lot of attention, they need a lot of water, they need a lot of compost, um, and they need to look perfect if they're gonna be used for wedding work. So you gotta factor in all that time energy and the price of the tuber or the corm or the bulb or the seed whatever when you're thinking about what to plant. So I hope that was clear. Just know who's your end customer and make sure to plan and plant for that person. Because if I was doing wedding work or if I was still selling to florists, I would definitely make sure I had a, a lot of white, peach, and any kind of popular color that season in May, June, and July. You see, I would direct what I'm planting towards who my customer is at the end of the day. All right, the next lesson is probably the most important lesson on the list, and that is to take soil health seriously. Now, I've worked in many different types of soils before. I've worked our farm soil. Um, I've worked at large public gardens, managed gardens for other people. Soil is different everywhere you go, you know, even going from my farm to my neighbor's yard to one neighbor over that has a wildflower meadow, our soils are going to be drastically different. And I really am not going to know what's going on inside of that soil unless I have it tested. So please spend, you know, the $50 that it's going to cost to take samples of your soil and send it off to a lab. Um, send it off to your local extension office. You're able to tell them what you plan to grow in that soil, and then they're gonna return to you the results of the missing nutrients in that soil. And they're gonna tell you, you know, do you need to add 
lime? Do you need to add kelp? Do you need to add bone meal? That is such valuable information because if you're planting the soil year after year after year after year and you're not giving back into that soil where the roots are, that soil is going to get weaker and weaker and weaker and weaker. So you have to feed your soil. You have to take it seriously. Um, I add nutrients in the fall so that they can kind of mix in through the winter and in the spring. And then I normally top dress our beds with homemade compost in the spring, probably about a month before I'm going to plant into them. So I hope that part's helpful. Okay, next up is to invest in a good seed starting setup because we're starting all these things from seed. We want to take care of our investment, our seed investment. We want to start out with a good grow light system and we also want to make sure to provide them with some kind of underneath heat. Now, I'm really fortunate here in our house, it's an older house, and it has the taller radiators with radiator covers. So I'm able to set all my seedlings on the radiators to help them germinate to get that underneath heat. But if you don't find yourself with those radiators, I would invest in you know, a few heat mats to get you started, especially for anything that is a little bit harder to germinate. It's really nice to have that underground heat to get them started. And then of course, you know, as soon as they pop up, you want to stick them under lights. I still use shop lights. You know, I use one cool, one hot bulb. Um, it doesn't look pretty, but it works and it gives me really strong seedlings. Um, you know, I just talked to someone the other day that was saying, what's more important? Is it more important to provide underneath heat or shop lights? And it's important to provide both, honestly. I don't really feel that, at least here in Zone 6B where I am in winter, I do not get enough light through my windows to provide the necessary lighting to grow strong, straight um, seedlings. I'm going to get really spindly stretch seedlings if I don't provide them with light. Um, another issue that I see sometimes people who do use lights for the first time is that they hang them up too high away from the plants. If you're just using uh, T5s, T8s, T12 bulbs, one hot and one cold, you need to have that light two to three inches above your seedlings at all times. You're going to need to move that light you know, up and down, but sometimes I see people hang the lights all the way up here and the seedlings are all the way down there. You want to get that seedling really strong, so go ahead, lower that light, you know, two to three inches above the highest seedling and move along, move that uh, light up as your seedlings grow. The third lesson is to be sure to plant enough foliage and filler. Now the name of the game here, if you're making mixed bouquets, is to plant 50% foliage filler, 50% focal and supporting flowers. Because if you're making a mixed bouquet, but you've only grown about 10% foliage and filler, you're gonna run out of that filler, especially if it's just an annual filler grown from seed. And then all of a sudden, you're left with maybe bunches of zinnias, larkspur, cosmos, snaps, whatever, it's going to be really hard to make a mixed arrangement without the necessary foliage and filler. And if you already have an established farm, you might have filler and foliage on your property that you can use, but just take that into consideration. Do I really have the 50% necessary to make mixed bouquets if that's what in fact you are creating? And of course, if you're growing by the stem to a florist, um, this is advice you can probably eliminate. Okay, next up, I wanna talk about the importance of supporting your flowers. And other than soil health, which I feel is number one, supporting your flowers when growing them for profit is so important. And I have seen entire flower fields completely decimated because the owner felt it was not that important to provide netting for all of their branching flowers. And it was so disappointing. And I know it's hard to invest in something like netting because it's not pretty. And you think, oh, it's, it's gonna be fine. They don't really need that. And if you've been gardening so many years, you think, oh, well, I've never netted zinnias before. I've never netted cosmos or snaps. 
but it's different when you are planning and planting a cutting garden. You need those stems to be straight in order for them to be usable and you need them to be strong. And because you're planting a mass of the same thing in that space, there's also a much greater chance of them falling over onto each other, therefore destroying an entire row or even an entire field. So please do take supporting your flowers seriously. Invest your money there also. Invest in the soil, invest in the support, and then I would actually invest in the seed third. And that's really the way that we should be doing it. We should be working from the ground up, right? And there's a couple different ways of supporting. Um, you know, depending on the crop, you might want to corral. That I only corral the first two years, which is basically, you know, if I have this rectangular bed, I'm going to be sticking posts into the ground about every eight feet surrounding that bed, and then taking twine and literally corralling the plants in kind of so they hug each other. You know, that's good for doing, you know, something like a chrysanthemum. But the majority of plants, I'm going to provide them with netting where there's, you know, squares. I'll link it down below if you've never seen um, this type of netting before. Um, and you just slip that over your stakes and the plants grow, you know, right through it. And I think some people are often worried about the way that looks, but we're growing for the end result. We're not growing because we're going to be looking you know, at netting and thinking, oh, I don't like the way that netting looks. <laughs> Trust me, you want the straight stems. You don't want to lose a whole crop of flowers. Invest in netting, corralling. Um, you know, there's a lot of perennials that are going to need staking, like delphiniums. Um, if you're growing hollyhocks, hollyhocks don't really last that long in the base, but some people like them, you know, certainly stake all those kinds of things. And then also trellising, you know, if you're working with sweet peas or something like that, definitely um, invest in a trellising system. Okay, next up is to make sure to succession sow certain plants. And this is really because we want to take advantage of the whole growing season. And some plants, like single stem sunflowers or gladiolas, they're giving us one flower. And hey, those are really um, great sellers. So I want to make sure I'm planting those guys every two weeks and I have a spot for them to go every two weeks. I did not succession sow my first year in business and what I did was basically I sowed two huge waves of flowers out in my field. I sowed a huge wave of hardy annuals, you know, early and then I sowed all my tender annuals about Mother's Day for, for our zone and what happened was I had this big boom of flowers twice in the year. Um, and that was great, but honestly, I'm all by myself. I mean, my husband helps me, but it's really just me. I could not keep up with the processing of that amount of flowers all at once. And I had waste. I had flowers to sell, but I didn't have time to turn them into bouquets and put them at the stand. So what I've learned through the years is to just succession sow. Every two to three weeks, I always like to have something else going in, coming out, going in, coming out. And definitely look at what are your most profitable flowers. And if they are things that only produce one stem, really have those cooking all through the season so that you take advantage of that money and you're not leaving anything on the table. So the last lesson is to just do your best to know your bugs, your animals, and your diseases to your particular area and to think about how you're going to combat them if they happen. Now I'm here in an area where we are completely organic and we're a certified pollinator friendly garden, meaning I can't spray anything at all. And personally, if I can't kill it between my two fingers or snip it in half with my snips, it stays out there. That's just a personal decision. But you learn as you go along, what are the bugs that you have? What are the diseases that you have? Do you have any larger animal pressure? I used to live in Pittsburgh where there was just deer everywhere and people had to have electric fences 
around anything that the deer liked. I'm fortunate that we don't have deer here, but we have a lot of rabbits because we're right next to a wildflower meadow, which is wonderful. And so I have to combat the rabbits by starting all of my sunflowers in trays, and then when I plant them out, I have to put chicken wire over them until they get a certain height, or else I know, because I've learned through the years, that the bunnies are going to come through and decimate that crop if I don't. You know, I've learned that my amaranth is going to get, you know, all eaten up by cucumber beetle at the end of the season. It just seems like no matter what I do come August, there comes the cucumber beetle. But I've learned that they only eat the foliage and I need the plume. So I do not bother to control that bug um, specifically. So I think it's just really a learning process, you know, as you go along you know, in your own field, you learn what's out there, and you do your best to plant things that are disease resistant. We get a lot of moisture here in our area, and so powdery mildew is often an issue. So things like the State Fair Zinnia or Cut and Come Again Zinnia, they just don't work for me. Where I've heard farmers that don't get a lot of rain, where, you know, they're providing water through drip tubing, which I don't need to do here, those zinnias work great for them. So it's just learning your zone. Talking to other farmers in your area about this is really helpful, especially with disease caused by weather. Um, and it's just a learning process and you kind of learn which bugs, animals, and diseases you can work with and just rotate and which ones you can tolerate and which ones you kind of need to step in and, you know, decide how you're going to control that bug. Well guys, I think that's all my tips on lessons for a beginning flower farmer that might often be overlooked. I really hope they were helpful and I really just hope that you take away from this video that when you're getting started, it's really about infrastructure and a lot of times the things that you can't see. You know, it's about soil health. That soil health is so important. It's about supporting your flowers. It's about growing the right flowers for your customer. Um, and it's about knowing that there are bugs, animals, and diseases out there and just educating yourself and thinking about how you want to control them or how you want to work with them. Well, until next time, happy gardening. Bye!